Uh, before I start, I'll just uh, very briefly allude to one point that you made about the US FDA approving of uh, approval of for drugs. The Director General of the India branch of the US FDA was here uh, yesterday, and we did discuss this particular aspect. And her answer was very clear that the FDA doesn't mandate or say this is how you should treat cancer. It just says whether a drug should be approved. And I think to some extent, we are just passing the buck on to the regulatory authorities and rather than take ownership of these decisions and the guidelines ourselves. So just a brief comment on that. So the next uh, few minutes, I'll be speaking about um, some of the efforts that we've been doing at the National Cancer Grid to, uh, to uh, look at uh, improving value for uh, care. So the uh, basis on which the Cancer Grid was started is based on this uh, heat map of uh, 75,000 patients who visited the Tata Memorial Hospital. Uh, these patients were geotagged based on their uh, uh, location or the geographical location. And as you can see, there's this uh, substantial number of patients who come from um, in and around Mumbai, which is where we are located. So the state of Maharashtra uh, sends 40% of our patients to, to uh, the Tata Memorial. But what is disturbing is the fact that 60% uh, of patients come uh, from very far. And it's not just the uh, neighboring states, which seems to be remarkably low in the number of patients they send us but a very high density seen in Northern, Eastern, and Northeastern India. And just to give you context, the time it takes for a patient to travel from Nahar Lagoon in Arunachal Pradesh to Mumbai could be easily up to two days, uh, depending on how you were uh, traveling. So this was the genesis of the uh, National Cancer Grid and the reason we uh, created this. Add to this is the fact that the projected cancer burden in India is likely to go up 70% in just under three decades. The number of absolute number of patients is likely to go up. And something that's been alluded to uh, very often, uh, which is the abysmally low funding for uh, funding public healthcare expenditure going towards health. So we've always averaged between one to 1.5 percent, and since 2000 till about uh, 2020, we were on a steady, very slow but steady increase, going up from uh, just under one to 1.5 percent. But um, uh, in spite of everything that uh, the government has been doing towards this. It actually saw a dip this year for the first time. It's gone down to 1.3% of GDP. And again, to give you context, the United States, which by no stretch of imagination is the model country to emulate as far as uh, public uh, I mean, healthcare expenditure is concerned, spends about 19% of the GDP on healthcare. The more moderate uh, country like uh, Thailand, which is offering universal healthcare, spends about 5% uh, to 6% of GDP. And that seems to be the sweet spot where you get actual good value for care. And uh, it, unless we rapidly scale up uh, our public health care expenditure, I don't think when 10, 20 years from now, we'll be talking anything different uh, from this stage. So just to give you context, public health care expenditure uh, between Canada and India, considering that the next highest demography in this hall is from Canada uh, after India, the percentage GDP spend from Canada is 11%. India was 1.5%. It's actually gone down to 1.3 now. The per capita GDP is 45,000. And the per capita GDP in India is 1940. And which means that an average Canadian citizen has the government spending $5,200 per individual on their healthcare, whereas India spends $29. So no amount of adjustment about your cost of cancer drugs is ever going to compensate for this. And even adjusting for purchasing power parity, this $29 would go to just about 100, 100, between $100 to $120. Uh, so clearly, there's much to be done as far as this is concerned. I'll come to the next aspect of uh, the challenge that we are facing, which is the human resource crunch. We are uh, sister institutions with uh, the MD Anderson, and we are remarkably similar in various aspects. We see almost the same number of patients. In fact, we see 10% more patients than they do. And while MD Anderson has 1,700 physicians and researchers on their, uh, on their faculty, we have 188. So it's a 9 to 1 ratio if you were to do adjustments for the total number of patients that we saw. So we had to come up with something very rapidly uh, disruptive, some out-of-the-box thinking to address these urgent problems. And towards this, we created the National Cancer Grid about uh, 10 years back. So um, one August morning in uh, 2012, uh, out of the 29 regional cancer center directors that we invited to be part of this uh, network, 17 of them um, came in. I suspect 14 or 15 of them were extremely skeptical, but just came because uh, they wanted to know what was happening. And uh, uh, we sat around the table and decided and tried to think of what the main challenges should be. And uh, from that point, I think we've come a long way. So one of the first uh, initiatives that we took, and again, here you'll see a number of very familiar names on the author list, 
is to look at uh, first the growing burden of cancer, the uh, challenges and priorities for cancer research in India, and finally, but most importantly, the delivery of affordable and equitable cancer care in India. So one of the first uh, initiatives we took was uh, uh, guidelines. Uh, we thought we should get consensus guidelines amongst the National Cancer Grant, and it's not been for lack of effort that these uh, initiatives hadn't been successful. The Indian Council of Medical Research had come up with a very ambitious plan uh, 10 years before the National Cancer Grid uh, to come up with uh, evidence-based guidelines. But 10 years after it was initiated, we had guidelines for only five or six cancers. So we were allowing the perfect to be the enemy of the good and allowing a very detailed, exhaustive guideline, uh, which obviously takes a lot of time to create. Uh, the result being that after 10 years, we had uh, no guidelines for most of the cancers. So we came up with a quick and dirty uh, algorithmic style of uh, guideline, which had two benefits. One, they actually could get read rather than a 72 page document, which most clinicians wouldn't have the time to read. And it also lends itself to rapid change based on new evidence or even change in the price of drugs. But I already mentioned to you about this uh, uh, study that we did, which meant that only 4% of patients who could afford trastuzumab could actually get the drug primarily because of cost. So we needed a different model to look at this. And we've seen this uh, study being mentioned several times uh, during today, where uh, uh, one of uh, Chris Booth's uh, fellows looked at a comparison between the ASCO and the ESMO value frameworks. I'll take a minute to explain how these work. The ASCO framework gives you a score. So the height of the bar corresponds to the value of the drug. So which means that the taller the bar, the better, the more value for money it is. Whereas the ESMO is a binary uh, uh, division, the blue bars mean that uh, they are not uh, value for money, whereas the red bars mean that they're value for money. And as you can see from this completely haphazard uh, graph, even the ASCO and the ESMO value frameworks did not agree with each other as far as what constituted value for uh, these treatments were. And as Chris mentioned, uh, neither am I a health economist, but the higher the cost of the drug, the lower the benefit it actually accrued. So completely going against all market economics that you would normally associate this with. With the result that we came up with our second edition of the uh, uh, NCG guidelines, which were resource stratified, which in addition to taking the benefit, the evidence that we had predominantly from Western studies uh, as a disclaimer, uh, we also took cost into the equation and there were value judgments which were made. These are not robust HTA assessments, value judgments made by a group of experts because that was the best we had at that time, which uh, divided these guidelines into what we called as optional, which took the, did not take cost into consideration, essential and optimal, which did take uh, cost into the consideration. And uh, one of the biggest impacts of the uh, NCG has been so far has been with uh, these resource stratified guidelines because when we launched these guidelines in 2017, or rather 2019, uh, the then deputy CEO of the National Health Authority, Dr. Dinesh Aroga, happened to be a part of that meeting. And even without consulting his CEO, decided that the NHA would adopt the NCG guidelines as a necessary prerequisite for reimbursement under the scheme. So though this was not our uh, primary intention, suddenly we realized that 40% of patients uh, in India covered under the Aishman Bharat scheme would have a level of quality attached to, the, to their cancer care. So uh, in addition to doing this, we also came up with a manual which uh, looked at formalizing the process that we would go through in future versions of the uh, uh, NCG guidelines, bringing in that element of uh, systematic appraisal of uh, evidence before we actually uh, came up with our next, uh, come up with our next uh, set of guidelines. The ideal would obviously be to have uh, a health technology assessment uh, program on the lines of uh, the NICE guidelines uh, in the um, UK, but uh, anyone who's worked in HTA realizes that the amount of time, effort, and money that it takes to create even one intervention evaluated by an HTA could be anywhere from 12 to 24 months, and this is with a lot of money being spent on that. So if you were to go that route, we would probably take 20 years to evaluate the existing interventions that we have and submit them to a full HTA. So again, rather than allow the perfect to be the enemy of the good, we took up an approach of something that we call adaptive HTA. So this is a well-recognized form of uh, health technology assessment, which looks at how other countries have evaluated their uh, interventions and adjusting it for purchasing power parity, the costs that are different in India compared to that country and so on. And over a period of the last year, we've been able to evaluate 10 such interventions. And this has been extremely helpful because now when any company uh, or uh, any pharmaceutical company goes to the NHA 
asking for their molecule to be included under the Aishman Bharat. They pass it on to us and we do an adaptive HTA and recommend whether this needs to be uh, approved or not. I must take this example of uh, a breast cancer drug, which uh, was proven to be effective, but extremely expensive. And uh, the company approached the NHA with the efficacy data and not the cost data. And then they came up with this solution that they would try and give a special pricing for patients covered under the NHA, under the Aishman Bharat scheme. And uh, to no one's surprise, uh, the, the, uh, the upper limit of reimbursement under the Aishman Bharat is 500,000 rupees. And the company priced their annual cost of the drug at 495,000 uh, rupees per year. So there was no system to this, this was to see except to gain the system and make sure that their drug was approved. So clearly, what happens if uh, this gets approved? The patient's uh, wife or husband who gets a myocardial infarction doesn't get the the coronary angioplasty or the uh, bypass that is required. More importantly, every rupee spent on an individual for what is not value for money uh, is taking away that rupee from someone else. So we clearly need something very, very different from this. And uh, we've created a core group within the NCG, which is now looking at evaluating additional uh, uh, interventions for HTA. I'll come to the Choosing Wisely initiatives, two of which we undertook under the NCG. The first, which was related to cancer. And surprisingly, for those of you who are not aware of the origin of Choosing Wisely, this uh, was started by the American Board of Internal Medicine with the view to start a conversation between physicians, patients, families, and policymakers, as well as patient advocates, trying to understand how to identify low-value care and trying to avoid those practices. Uh, we created a nine-member uh, task force, which was very diverse. We had representation from medical, surgical, radiation, oncology. And for the first time ever, uh, uh, we had patient representatives as part of the, the Choosing Wisely uh, uh, effort for uh, cancer in India. And again, this is the first Choosing Wisely initiative, which has been done outside of a high-income country. So the guiding principles on which we uh, tried to uh, get consensus on these recommendations was that uh, there needed to be clear evidence of either no benefit or, or harm. It had to be something that was of frequent use in India. It was likely to cost some uh, cost money, including opportunity costs. The item that was recommended needed to be clear. It needed to be measurable, and it needed to be relevant to the Indian context. So we went through a four-phase system of uh, Delphi consensus amongst this nine-member task force. And at the end of it, uh, we came up with 10 recommendations, which are then circulated to all the major uh, oncology societies and ratified. So this was published uh, a few years back uh, in the Lancet Oncology. And for those of you who are interested, that's the reference. And these are the list of 10 recommendations that uh, we came up with. With the experience of uh, 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 cancer uh, choosing wisely, uh, we came up with uh, an, uh, with a an option that was kind of forced on us, which was thanks to the COVID pandemic. And though none of us can claim to be infectious disease specialists, our experience with the choosing wisely for cancer helped us do this. And uh, there's a lot of parallels between uh, the costs of care, the low value care in cancer, to what was happening during the pandemic. And many of you might be aware of the, the sense of panic amongst the general public, a lot of non evidence based uh, treatment, including by the American president. Uh, rampant medical overuse uh, of drugs, investigations, everything, and uh, in an inadequate public health response. And uh, this was therefore ideally suited for uh, choosing wisely for COVID-19. So we created a larger group this time because uh, we did not have the expertise in infectious disease. So we got representatives from public health, epidemiology, general practice, primary care, infectious disease, virology, the entire spectrum of individuals who are uh, who are stakeholders for management of COVID-19 and again included patient representatives and civil society. Very similar exercise as for choosing wisely for cancer. We had 47 this time in the long list, thanks to the fact that we had far more uh, non-evidence-based uh, treatments for COVID compared to uh, cancer. And we again came up with final uh, set of 10 recommendations, five of which were directed to the general public and five for physicians. The only difference between this and the choosing wisely for cancer was that we had compressed timelines given the uh, pandemic and the fact that we had to come up with these recommendations fairly quickly. And while we took five months for the choosing wisely for cancer, we had to do this in probably three weeks uh, from starting it. And this time, this was an international recommendation and not just a choosing wisely India recommendation. I think someone asked about the impact of these, uh, uh, these recommendations. It's one thing to have a recommendations and another thing to have a look at impact. Soon after the uh, publication of the choosing wisely for COVID-19, a bunch of us, about uh, 18 of us, wrote to the then Principal Secretary of India, uh, Professor Vijay Raghavan, 
demonstrating the lack of evidence and actual harm with convalescent plasma. And within a week of writing that letter, the, there was an ordinance passed by the Ministry of Health which uh, banned the convalescent plasma in the management of uh, COVID-19. So clearly there are some areas where there is, uh, it's probably easier to make some progress. So this was the chosen wisely for COVID-19, the five recommendations for the uh, general public and five for physicians. And on to this final, uh, which uh, Richard, Chris and I wrote about um, the value of care. And what you can see here is different countries and different um, uh, cancers being looked at. And the width of the bar that you see here shows the difference between the performance of the highest performing countries and the lowest performing countries. So as you can see in some cancers, depending on which pin code you belong to, there could be a 30 to 40% difference in five year survival. So clearly it was not, and this is adjusted stage for stage. And clearly this demonstrates that uh, it's not just science which matters, but also there is other social and demographic features which make it important. I think a lot of you are thinking, maybe the best performing countries were the ones which spent the most. Maybe they are the United States of the world and the Canadas of the world, but we looked at what we, whether there was a correlation between the cost or, or the public health care expenditure of these countries and whether they reflected the outcomes as well. And again, you can see a negative correlation. It was not necessarily the highest spending countries which had the best outcomes. And not for a moment suggesting that we should remain happy with our 1.3% spend on public health care, but clearly just spending more money is not the answer. So uh, with this paper, we came up with three uh, major shifts in opinion, which we recommended. The first being that we needed to change the global mindset and look for value-based interventions. The second, that we needed to fund human capital and social development, uh, fund, invest in people, invest in basic technology and safe, affordable cancer care. And finally, to implement standards and systems of uh, accountability, none of which are very prevalent in many middle income countries. And we call this, um, Vishal calls it ground shot, we call it the earth shots, it doesn't matter. What it means is to look at what is implementable in the, in the uh, community rather than go after those cancer moon shots. Thank you very much for your attention.